Hello everyone, this is Dr. Zaidi. Welcome to my YouTube channel, ZTube. Today we are going to discuss cost behavior analysis. So what is cost behavior? Cost behavior is basically how cost reacts in response to changes in the level of activity. So for example, if activity level goes up, the cost will go up. The activity level goes down, cost goes down. A good example of this is um, the cost of gasoline, right? If you put $100 gasoline every 200 miles that you drive, what is driving the cost? The number of miles driven is driving the cost. So the activity is number of miles driven. If you park your car at home and you don't drive, you can put $100 gas, it's gonna stay there, right? As long as the car is parked and as long as um, you're not driving. So the, the cost driver or the level of activity drive cost and how the cost react in response to that level of activity is known as cost behavior, okay? Cost object, another important aspect that you need to know is the cost object. Cost object is anything you are accumulating or measuring a cost for. So for example, if you're trying to find a cost of a computer, the computer is a cost object. If you're trying to find a cost of uh, a department, how much it costs you to run a department, then the department is the cost object. If you're trying to find a cost of hiring a professor, then the professor is a cost object. If you're trying to find a cost of hiring a lawyer, then the lawyer is a cost object. So cost object is anything that you're trying to associate a cost with, right? Anything you're trying um, to accumulate or measure a cost for is known as a cost object. Now we are going to discuss the cost classifications for predicting cost behavior. So this is the agenda for my upcoming slides here. We are going to discuss variable cost. We are going to discuss fixed cost, right? Both in uh, total and in uh, unit terms. We are going to discuss linearity assumptions after that and a relevant range. We are going to discuss the fixed cost that we use for planning purposes, and then we're going to discuss mixed cost. So let's start with the variable cost first. So in a variable cost, we first have a total variable cost. And as you see my graph, the graph looks like is upward sloping, right? Uh, so as you can see here from the graph, if you are producing one unit, the cost of the total variable cost is $10. If you're producing two units, the total cost is $20 for producing two units. Three units, the total cost is 30. And that can also be seen right here on the table on the right-hand side where it says, if you don't produce anything, which is the origin right here, it costs you nothing. Zero times 10 is zero. Basically total variable cost is a multiplication of the number of units or the quantity times variable cost per unit. So you, it costs you $0 if you produce zero unit. If you produce one unit, it will cost you $10. You produce two unit, it will cost you $20 and so on and so forth. So the more units you produce, the more is going to be a total variable cost. That's why the total variable cost curve is a upward sloping, right? So the, so the way you define total variable cost is that the total variable cost is directly related to the level of activity which means is, as you can see from the arrows here, right, the uh, uh, vertical arrow goes upwards and the horizontal arrow goes rightwards, which suggests that it's a direct relationship between the quantity and the dollar amount. Y axis is your cost or the dollar amount and the X axis is the quantity or the unit. Quantity and unit are always going to be on your X axis and the dollar amount is going to be on your y-axis. So this suggests that the total variable cost has a direct relationship with the level of activity. The more units you're going to produce, the higher is going to be your total variable cost. And that can be seen from the example of number of miles driven. The more mileage you're going to drive, the more is going to be your gasoline cost. Or any other example um, you can take if you buy if you go to grocery store and if you buy one apple, the cost of one apple, let's say is $1, you have to pay $1. If you buy two apples, you have to pay $2. So the more quantity you're going to purchase, the more you have to pay. The more labor hours 
a labor is going to incur, the more you have to pay for the labor. If, if they earn $10 an hour, they work one hour, you have to pay $10. If they work two hours, you have to pay $20. So the total variable cost varies directly with the level of activity. Next is the unit variable cost. Now the unit variable cost is also known as marginal cost, like marginal cost of producing additional unit. The unit variable cost stays constant. So you can see here in the definition, variable cost per unit remains constant or it stays constant. Why it stays constant? Because you're producing, this is the additional cost of producing one additional unit. So for first unit, the cost of production is $10 for the second unit just the second unit, not the total variable cost. The second unit, to produce a second unit, the variable cost per unit is still $10. For the third unit, the unit variable cost is still $10. So the unit variable cost curve is a horizontal line, the horizontal straight line, because it doesn't change. And as you can see from the table here on the right hand side, if you produce zero unit, you don't have to pay anything, you produce one unit, you incur $10, two unit, you still incur $10, but this is for the second unit. This is not for two units. This is for the second unit. For the third unit, it's $10. For the fourth unit is $10 again, right? So if you have to calculate the total cost, then you have to multiply for four units. It will be four times $10, right? So that's how you count. So here we are only calculating variable cost per unit. So variable cost per unit remains constant. Now there is a concept of relevant range we are going to discuss in upcoming slide. So I'm going to leave this definition um, halfway here and we're going to discuss when we're going to discuss the relevant range. Let's move on to our next concept, the total fixed cost. Just like your va uh, unit variable cost curve, which is a horizontal straight line, the total fixed cost curve is also a horizontal straight line. Right, total fixed cost example is like paying a rent. So if you are paying $1,000 rent, whether you spend uh, zero night at your home, one night, two night, three night, you still have to pay $1,000 rent. Or if you are paying a car insurance, whether you park your car um, in your garage for 30 days or you drive 10 miles or you 20 miles or 30 miles, you still have to pay uh, the monthly insurance premium. Right, so that's a, the example of a total fixed cost in a factory perspective, if you are paying a factory lease, then that $1,000 on the left hand side here on the vertical axis, that's a $1,000 rent that you are paying or the lease that you're paying for the factory building. Now, whether you produce no unit, you produce one unit, two units or three units, you still have to pay fixed cost. So regardless of the number of units produced, your fixed cost stays constant. So the way you define is the total fixed cost remains constant. Now, again, this definition is incomplete as we are going to discuss the relevant range concept in our upcoming slide to complete this definition. Unit fixed cost or fixed cost per unit is inversely related to the level of activity. What it means is that the more units you produce, the less is going to be your fixed cost per unit or the higher the activity level, the lower is going to be your cost per unit. So if you can see in the graph here, as you are producing more and more units, your fixed cost per unit is declining. The arrow suggests, the red arrow suggests that uh, the cost is declining when the units are increasing. And the green arrow suggests when the number of units produced are decreasing, the cost is increasing, right, on per unit basis. So when you are, you are producing one unit, you're going to allocate the total whole 1,000 fixed cost to one unit. But when you produce two units, you split that cost into half because now you have two units. So 500 and 500 each. The table on the right hand side shows this relationship here. You produce one, one unit, 1,000 divided by one is 1,000 per unit fixed cost. When you produce two units, it becomes 500. Yeah, you produce three units, it becomes 333.33, fourth unit, 250, and then fifth unit, $200. So the more units you're producing, the less is going to be your fixed cost per unit, which will also decrease your total cost, because total cost is the combination of your total variable cost plus total fixed cost. 
We're going to discuss this when we will discuss our mixed cost. But here, what you can see is the downward sloping curve of a unit fixed cost is not a straight line, unlike the upward sloping curve in your total variable cost, which was a straight line. Remember, unit fixed cost curve is not going to be a straight line. However, it will never ever intersect with either y-axis or x-axis. It can go as close as possible to x-axis, but it will never intersect. Same as with the y-axis. It can go as close to y-axis as possible, but it will never intersect y-axis. So the fixed cost per unit is inversely related to the level of activity. The next is the linearity assumption. What is the linearity assumption? So when we do cost behavior analysis, we assume that the costs are a linear function, right? Within a relevant range, they are linear. So if you see here, initially our total variable cost line was this red line, which was a straight line, which suggests that if you produce one unit, your cost is going to be $10, you produce two units, your cost is going to be $20, which suggests a direct relationship between um, your number of units produced and the total variable cost. Now the green line shows uh, a curvilinear relationship or not a straight line, so which uh, is against the linearity assumption. And now when this happens is when you have inefficiency, you, you know, if the labor is working, they may consume more time or if they are breaking raw materials or destroying material or they are less efficient, they may take longer time to produce. If that's the case, the cost for producing one unit may skyrocket, right? And then when, as they progress and they learn uh, the new methods of uh, um, getting the tasks done as quickly as possible, or they become more efficient over time, the cost per unit decreases, which is depicted by this portion of the curve right here. Here the cost per unit is, is minimum, right? And again, maybe for some reason the cost is increasing, whether it's a strike and they still have to pay for labor or whether they lost the, um, uh, the raw material or they, the raw material um, had a high demand due to which the uh, supplier has increased the price. So for any reason, the, the cost for material can again go high or the cost for labor can go high for any reason. So in, you know, so the assumption for um, the co um, cost behavior analysis is that, that the costs are linear, right? So you avoid this kind of behavior, which is depicted by the green line. Now, the next one is the relevant range. The relevant range is the range in which our cost behavior assumptions are true, right? Or whether we perform a cost, vol uh, cost volume profit analysis in a range in which our assumptions are true is known as the uh, relevant range. So if you can see here in this graph, the cost per unit was $10. And then on the horizontal line, from one to 100, it shows that the cost per unit is $100, but then suddenly it's dropping to half, maybe $5, maybe $6. So it's dropping to, dropping to half, and then it stays constant. So why this happens is, for example, if you are buying a raw material from a supplier and they said that, okay, you buy 100 pounds of you know, plastic from me, um, for first 100 pounds, I'll give you plastic for $10 a pound. And for the next 100 pounds that you buy, I'll give you a quantity discount. And instead of charging $10 a pound, for the next 100 pounds, I'll charge you only $5 a pound, right? And then they can give further discount if you buy 300 pounds or more, right? So that relevant range is the range in which your first price that you were paying $10 is true, right? Which is first 100 pounds. So here the line is drawn that your assumption, which is a straight line too, is true within the relevant range. Variable cost stays constant within a relevant range because after this range, 
variable cost is not constant anymore. It's dropping and it may further drop or can go up, right? It depends. So within the relevant range, this range, this assumption is true that the variable cost stays constant. And it, it can be seen on the table here from one to 100 pounds, the variable cost per unit is $10. Uh, then when you produce, start producing 101, 101, 101th unit or you're buying the 101st pound, then your cost per unit drop to $5 until the next range. Same thing is true with the total fixed cost. Now total fixed cost in our first example was $1,000. So you are paying factory rent $1,000. But if factory has a limited capacity and it can produce only up to 2,000 units, and then the demand for your product goes up and you have to produce another 2,000, another 10,000, then what do you do? You probably have to rent another facility or you have to lease another facility, buy another facility, buy more machines, buy higher new labor. Then your fixed cost is going to jump, right? So in your first 2,000 for production of your first 2,000 units, your fixed cost was same $1,000. But then suddenly when you started producing more than 2000, you have to rent another facility, lease another facility, buy more equipment or anything. Your cost went up from 1000 to $2,000. And then it stays $2,000 until the next relevant range, whatever it is, 4,000 units or 5,000 or 6,000, it stays the same. So Total fixed cost stays constant within the relevant range, and that is the relevant range. After this range, our assumption is no longer valid. So for cost behavior analysis assumption, you know, we assume that the fixed cost, total fixed cost stays constant within the relevant range. And you can see here in the table here is from one to one, 2000 units that you're producing, your total fixed cost stays $1,000. And then again, when you jump to 2001 unit, you have to rent another facility and then you start paying $2,000 until the next relevant range. Now we move on to our fixed cost for planning purposes. So we have two kinds of fixed costs for planning purposes. One is the, uh, the committed fixed cost and the other one is the discretionary fixed cost. So fixed costs, committed fixed costs is what? Committed fixed costs is what that cannot be changed in a short run. Or if you change in a short run, it may have a significant impact on your profitability or you have to pay severe penalties. So for example, the factory lease, if you have signed 10 year factory lease, five year factory lease, and you decide that after one year that you want to close the factory or a portion of factory and you save that lease, then no. If you have signed a lease and you have to pay severe penalty, then you will have to pay severe penalty for that. You cannot reduce the size of the a factory or close the factory and get out of the lease, right? Same as with the machines and other stuff. Whereas the discretionary fixed costs are the fixed costs that can be managed in a short run or that can be changed or that can be avoidable in a short run. That's why it's also known as managed fixed costs, right? The example of this could be the research and development cost. You know, you can commit for one year that you're going to spend $100,000 on research and development, but then next year you decide that you don't have sufficient fund, you didn't have enough profitability, you're not going to make, um, you know, you're not going to designate that much amount for um, your research and development and you reduce that amount from 100,000 to 80,000. Similar thing for advertising budget. If you have, you know, fixed advertising budget that every year you're going to spend 50,000 on advertising next year, you realize that this is not, uh, um, uh, this is too much uh, amount of money and we already have a great sales. We don't need $50,000 to invest in advertising. You may reduce your budget to 40,000, 30,000. If you want to increase your budget, if you think this is less, then you can also increase your budget too. So discretionary fixed cost is the managed fixed cost because you can manage in a short run. The next item is the mixed cost. Mixed cost is also known as semi-variable cost or semi-variable cost is also known as the total cost as you can see from the graph. 
So what is mixed cost? Mixed cost is a combination of your variable cost and fixed cost. As you can see from the graph, right? Right here, $1,000 was your total fixed cost. So when you were producing zero unit, you still had to pay $1,000. And then you moved your total variable cost curve and then you started from the y-intercept where your total fixed cost was intersecting your y-axis. So you started from there. So that becomes your total cost. Why this is total cost? Because it has a portion of your total variable cost. Look at the green line here, total variable cost. From this point where the line, red line is of total fixed cost and to the top of your total cost line, that's your total variable cost. Anything below, you know, between the blue line and the red line is the total fixed cost. So the total cost is total variable cost plus total fixed cost, okay? You can also see from this equation, total cost is total variable cost plus total fixed cost. So mixed cost is a combination of total variable cost and total fixed cost. What are some of the examples of mixed cost? Pretty much, uh, you know, anything that you can um, do it in factory or let's say example of a U-Haul, you pay nineteen ninety nine for getting a U-Haul and then they charge you um, uh, for every mile that you drive over 100 miles. So once you cross 100 miles, they will charge you like 50 cents a mile. So it has a fixed portion, but it is also has a variable portion or your electricity bill. So if your electricity bill comes and you never stayed in your house and you still see that you have a um, electricity bill is because of the taxes, the city taxes, the county taxes or the you know, state taxes, whatever taxes are um, you know, uh, applicable, that are included in your electricity bill. You may have used zero kilowatt, but you will still receive the, uh, the, uh, the taxes on the electricity bill. And then when you start using you know, uh, electricity, the more kilowatts you use, the higher is gonna be your bill. So it has a built-in fixed portion, but it also has a variable portion. So a lot of costs are, total costs are like, you know, have a variable and fixed portion here, which is also known as mixed cost. So in this equation, if you see total cost is total variable cost plus total fixed cost, total variable cost is variable cost per unit, times unit, which you have already seen in my previous slides. So this table shows how the total cost per unit is impacted as you produce more and more unit. Okay, so last um, column here shows you total cost per unit as you produce more and more unit. So here on column one, you have the variable cost per unit, which is constant within a relevant range. Your units, you're increasing, you know, number of units, one, two, three, four, five. Then you have total fixed cost, which is also constant within a relevant range, 1000, which is also shown in graph right here. Then you have a total cost. The total cost is again, your variable cost per unit times unit plus total fixed cost. So what we are doing is variable cost per unit is 10, times one, that's 10, plus total fixed cost 1,000, so 1,010. And right here, I have also put a formulas here, A, B, C, and then D equals to A times B plus C, right? For producing two units, the total cost is 1,020. For producing three units is 1,030. Producing four units, 1,040, and producing five units is 1,050. But that's the total cost of producing five units, 1,050. Now, if you come to the total cost per unit, as you are producing more and more units, your total cost per unit is decreasing. So right here, if you only produce one unit, it's costing you $1,000. So if you have to make a profit by selling this unit, you have to sell it for at least $1,001 to make $1 profit, right? However, if you produce two units, the cost per unit declines. It becomes $510. Now, if you sell a unit for $511 each, you can still make $1, $1 on both units, right? Which is a lot lesser for, you know, that you were charging um, when you were selling one unit, $1,001 compared to 511. So as you, you sell more and more units, your cost per unit declines. And the reason for that is because your fixed cost 
is fixed and it spreads among more and more units because it has an inverse relationship to number of units produced. So the more units you produce, the less is going to be your fixed cost per unit. Thank you for watching my video. Please subscribe my channel for live updates.